Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today we are checking out Gigabyte's gaming OC version of the RTX 3080. Now I think this is their sort of mid-range-ish offering. It's coming in at $750 US. Now of course no one can actually buy an RTX 3080 of any sort, so the price doesn't matter too much. And this is due to extremely limited supply from NVIDIA. Uh, supply really does seem to be the main issue here, not just the high demand. Anyway. Hopefully, at some point in the not too distant future, you'll have your choice of many different RTX 3080 graphics cards. And when that time comes, you'll know whether or not the Gigabyte Gaming OC model is any good. Now, so far I've checked out RTX 3080 variants from the likes of Nvidia with their Founders Edition, MSI's Gaming X Trio, and the ASUS Tough Gaming OC. Okay, so let's start by taking a look around Gigabyte's RTX 3080 Gaming OC graphics card. Right away, I've got to say, upon initial inspection, it appears very basic and I suppose somewhat small for a custom RTX 3080 graphics card, though I suppose that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it really is just the height of the gaming OC that makes this card appear much smaller than competing products from the likes of MSI and ASUS, for example, as it stands just 129mm tall, making it 8% shorter than the Gaming X Trio. The rest of the dimensions though are suitably high end as it measures 320 millimeters long and 55 millimeters wide. So it takes up three expansion slots. That means in terms of length and width, it's basically identical to the Gaming X Trio. Then in terms of weight, it is similar to the Tough Gaming weighing in at 1357 grams. So that's about 13% lighter than the Gaming X Trio. Now, despite Ampere being quite a big leap forward from Turing in terms of raw performance and then of course power draw, Gigabyte hasn't gone too crazy with the design. It's really not that dissimilar to past high-end gaming OC graphics cards. We're looking at a very familiar WinForce 3X cooler featuring two 90mm fans with a smaller 80mm fan towards the IO end of the card. And as we saw with the ASUS models, the centrally located fan does spin in a clockwise direction with the outer fans spinning counterclockwise. The fans are also encased in a silver and black plastic fan shroud, which it looks decent. Though I have to say, I don't really love the notch in the top left corner, and this appears to be carried over from the design of the 3090 model, which features NV link connectors. Obviously, it's just far more cost effective to make a single design for both the 3080 and 3090 gaming OC cards. But I feel the 3080 would have benefited from using this space, which would have allowed for three 90mm fans. Just quickly, the Gigabyte logo is LED backlit and under it is a small light bar. Both feature RGB lighting and offer a typical level of customization. It's quite minimalistic, which I think is nice. Moving around to the back side of the card, we find a full length silver backplate with a number of cutouts for airflow. It's a decent looking backplate, though it is much thinner than versions we've found on other RTX 30 series graphics cards. And then the pass at the end of the card is designed to enhance airflow. And this is something we've seen on other models, but like many of them, it really only looks to benefit a very small portion of the cooler. Also reducing its effectiveness are the dual eight pin PCIe power connectors, which oddly aren't attached directly to the PCB. So the extension cables actually block quite a lot of the airflow here. And given this card stands just 129 millimeters tall, I would have thought placing these connectors on the PCB towards the middle of the card would have worked just fine. Anyway, finally, around the IO end of the card, we find two HDMI 2.1 ports and three DisplayPort 1.4a outputs. Though please note only four of these outputs can be used simultaneously. Okay, so time to pull this thing apart. And as expected, the bulk of the weight is accounted for by the heatsink. Here we find a 965 gram cooler, which is quite a substantial weight given its size. The fin density here is very high and transferring heat away from the GPU is a large copper base plate featuring seven six millimeter copper heat pipes. The copper base removes heat from not just the GA102 die, but also the 10 GDDR6X memory chips, which make contact with the base using thick thermal pads. There's also two aluminium plates attached to the underside of the heatsink, which are designed to extract heat from the VRM components, including both the power stages and inductors. Overall, it is a high quality looking cooler that I expect to perform very well. The only disappointing aspect of this design is the back plate, which hasn't been utilized as a heat spreader by using thermal pads on the rear side of the PCB. This is something we've seen all other RTX 3080 graphics cards doing, and it can slightly help reduce temperatures for stuff like the GDDR6X memory and the VRM. 
Moving over to the PCB, you'll notice that there's no additional bracing or structural support devices here like what we've seen on other RTX 3080 models. So it'll be interesting to see over time how well the PCB handles the weight of the almost one kilogram cooler. It is worth noting that the cooler is already causing some points of the PCB to flex a bit more than you'd possibly like. Not sure if that's gonna cause problems down the track, but it is certainly flexing more than we have seen on other models. The PCB itself is very small, measuring just 235 millimeters long and 95 millimeters tall, making it the smallest AIB card we've seen so far. In terms of power delivery, we find two 8-pin PCIe power inputs with 17 Alpha and Omega 50 amp power stages, which is slightly above what the NVIDIA reference spec calls for. Speaking of the base spec, on the rear side of the PCB behind the GPU, we find half a dozen SP caps handling the filtering. However, these caps have a higher capacitance than what the base spec calls for. And as Buildzoid was quick to point out, Gigabyte has fully populated this section of the PCB with MLCCs, which most other brands haven't done. So there's absolutely no reason to suspect this design is any worse than what we see with something like the Tough Gaming, for example, which uses MLCC caps exclusively. But of course we will try our hand at manual overclocking soon. Also worth mentioning is the fact that the card features a dual BIOS with a switch that allows you to toggle between them and this requires a system reset. The default mode is the OC BIOS but there is a second silent BIOS which I imagine is meant to lower the fan curve. That said while the second BIOS can be enabled and it does work on my card it doesn't actually differ from the primary BIOS so while nice to have a backup it isn't a silent BIOS. Now in terms of clock specifications, Gigabyte lists a core clock frequency of 1800 MHz, which is a 5% boost over the 1710 MHz default spec. The GDDR6X memory though, that's been left stock at 19 gigabits per second. So we're just looking at a typical mild GPU overclock here. All that said, let's move on to see what clock speeds this model maintains when under load. Here's a look at the operating temperatures in Shadow of the Tomb Raider after 30 minutes of gameplay. The Gigabyte Gaming OC peaked at just 65 degrees in a 21 degree room inside our Corsair Obsidian 500D test system, fully populated with fans. That's a massive 13 degree drop in temperature when compared to Nvidia's Founders Edition model. However, in order to maintain this temperature, the fans spun at up to 1800 RPM, and while that's a reasonably high fan speed, the card was surprisingly quiet, generating just 40 decibels of noise. And that makes it slightly quieter than the FE version. The typical core clock speed seen during our test was 1935 MHz and that's a 5% increase over the Founders Edition model. And this saw power consumption increase by 10% from 323 watts of the FE version to 354 watts with the Gaming OC. Now overclocking, with the limits reached we saw a peak operating temperature of just 67 degrees but this time the fan spun up to 1900 RPM. And again it wasn't terribly loud at this fan speed. The overclock saw the cores operate at 2 GHz and the memory also hit 20.6 gigabits per second, so that's a pretty impressive transfer speed. Finally, we saw when overclocked, the card sucked down 358 watts, so just a percent increase from the stock factory OC configuration. Okay, so let's move into the benchmark graphs. As usual, we're testing with our AMD Ryzen 3950X GPU test rig with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200CL14 memory. The latest drivers available at the time of testing have been used, and for this one, we have just a few select games to look at. I'm actually not gonna bother going over each graph individually. We're just gonna skim over the game benchmark data as it's pretty much more of the same. The Gigabyte Gaming OC did overclock a little bit better than what we've seen with previously tested models, but this is likely due to silicon quality. So as always, take the OC results with a grain of salt as they're representative of a single model provided by the manufacturer. Stock out of the box performance is basically identical to that of the MSI Gaming X Trio and ASUS Tough Gaming OC, as all three models run at very similar clock speeds. Basically, all three averaged 1935 MHz in our shut off the Tomb Raider test after 30 minutes of gameplay. As for power consumption, the factory OC models from the likes of ASUS, MSI and Gigabyte all consume more power than the stock NVIDIA Founders Edition model. That said, using NVIDIA's PCAT tool, we found that the gaming OC consumes around 3% or 10 watts more than the MSI and ASUS models when stock. Despite that though, once manually overclocked to their maximum stable frequency, power consumption was similar across the board. 
Okay, so here we have the GPU temperature measured when using the internal sensor. And first we'll talk about the stock out of the box results using the default BIOS for cards with dual bar switches. The hottest running model is Nvidia's FE card, which is also the loudest. Though it is worth noting that this is the only dual slot card we've tested. The next hottest running card is the Gaming X Trio, but it only spins its fans at 1300 RPM and is by far the quietest here. Then we find Gigabyte's Gaming OC peaking at just 65 degrees, though it was spinning its fans at 1800 RPM. That said, it was slightly quieter than the Asus Tough Gaming, which ran just 2 degrees cooler. Now if we noise normalize the results, we find that the Gaming X Trio, Gaming OC and Tough Gaming OC are all pretty much the same in terms of GPU temperature. Sure, the Gigabyte Gaming OC is seen to be running 2 degrees hotter, but that's a negligible difference at what's already a very low temperature. It's also worth noting that all AIB models run significantly cooler than the Founders Edition version. Here's a look at the PCB temperature directly behind the GPU, and again we find that the custom AIB models run much cooler than Nvidia's FE model. The ASUS Tough Gaming OC is a standout here, but even the 62 degrees of Gigabyte's Gaming OC is still excellent, despite being 13 degrees hotter than the Tough Gaming OC. As for VRM temperatures, out of the box, the Gigabyte Gaming OC does well, peaking at just 74 degrees, and again, while quite a bit hotter than the Tough Gaming OC, it's still a very acceptable temperature. Then finally, we have the GDDR6X temperatures, and here the AIB models are again all quite similar, and when noise normalized, the Gigabyte Gaming OC peaked at just 70 degrees, which means the internal component temperature shouldn't be any higher than about 90 degrees, which is well within spec as these chips are safe to run at over 100 degrees. Overall, Gigabyte's RTX 3080 Gaming OC graphics card is a solid contender with no real flaws or issues to speak of. I had heard reports that the power connector pins do push out when you put the power cable in, wasn't an issue with this model, not sure if that was an early production thing or something, but I installed the cable about a dozen times in this card, no problems at all with the pins, I even tried to push one out with the screwdriver, couldn't really do it, so yeah, not sure what that was all about, but anyway, this card was fine, hopefully that is the case for all other models that you'll be able to buy sometime in the future. Obviously right now you can't buy any RTX 3080 graphics card, at least not easily, but when the time comes that you can buy a graphics card or this happens to be the only model that pops up, then I wouldn't hesitate to snap it up as it is a very good RTX 3080 graphics card. Price wise, it's really not bad at $750 US. That is a $50 premium over the MSRP, but that prices it alongside the ASUS Tough Gaming OC, which is arguably a slightly better product, but they're so close, it almost doesn't matter. The only issue for Gigabyte here being that the non-OC version of the Tough Gaming, which is basically the same product as the OC model, same cooler and all that, it can be had for $700 US, so bang on the MSRP, or at least that's what it would cost if it was actually in stock. But what this means is, in a world where you could actually buy an RTX 3080, so bear with me in this imaginary land, the base model Tough Gaming would be the card to get, and that is assuming it amounts to whatever $50 US cheaper is in your region. Anyway, right now we're not living in that fantasy world, so if availability of the gaming OC becomes a thing, like I said, I wouldn't hesitate to snap it up at $50 US over the MSRP. There's no concerns here about build quality or board design slash component choice. The card was extremely stable with the latest driver and overclocking headroom is as good as any card we've seen, while the thermals were excellent across the board. So that is going to do it for our review of the Gigabyte RTX 3080 Gaming OC. If you enjoyed this review, feel free to give it one of those. You can also subscribe for more content. We do have more RTX 3080 custom AIB card reviews coming up on the channel. Again, I know you can't buy these things right now, at least not easily, so that sucks, but we want to have a look at thermals and performance and overclocking headroom and all that sort of stuff with as many cards as we can, because by the time you can buy them, if you should still buy them at that point in time, depending on what AMD does, You'll know which models to avoid, which ones to focus on, such as this one. Obviously, that is the point of a detailed review, is to let you know if there are any problems or... I'm sure you guys get the idea of what the reviews are about. So as I said, if you enjoyed and appreciated this review, then give it a like. You can also subscribe to us on Patreon if you would like to get more hardware unbox goodness, access to our private Patreon Discord chat, very awesome community over there. And you can of course chat to Tim and myself there, 
We also have monthly live streams. Again, you can chat to Tim and myself there live and ask questions live with the other Harbour Unbox Patreon members. We do that once a month. Q and A's, behind the scenes videos. Anyway, very cool. But if you're not interested, that is also very cool. That's fine. And that is really gonna do it for this one. So I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.